Hello, my name is Amber and this is You Look Like a Badger, a monthly podcast where I discuss queer cinema. This month is February and therefore it is mandatory to talk about all things romance. The theme for this month is Queering the Heart. So every February I talk about the romance genre. This season I am picking films that have had a controversial impact or have caused some discourse in one way or another. So this month's pick is Chasing Amy. Archie and the Riverdale gang were a pure and fun-loving bunch. You can't find dysfunction in those comics. They were just flat out wholesome. Archie and Jughead were lovers. Shut the fuck up! It's true. Archie was the bitch and Jughead was the butch. That's why Jughead wears that crown looking hat all the time. Be the king of Queen Archie's world. I feel a hate crime coming on. Oh, well, you know, he does have a point. I mean, Archie never did quite settle on Betty or Veronica. Because he wanted them both at the same time, you assholes. He didn't choose one because he was trying to get them both into a three-way. Chasing Amy is a 1997 romantic dramedy directed by Kevin Smith, starring Ben Affleck, Joey Lauren Adams and Jason Lee. It follows Holden as he pursues Alyssa despite the fact she's gay. What follows is an exploration of monogamy, queerness and the true extent of male fragility and entitlement over queer women's sexuality. Though this film has its critics and has been considered a failure in terms of lesbian representation, I was surprised at just how many bisexual and queer women like it in the same way that I did. Despite this season being for controversial films, I did actually struggle to find that many formal dissenting critiques of queer representation in the film, though I did find many, many negative reviews. So this film won two Independent Spirit Awards, one for Best Screenplay and Jason Lee won Best Supporting Actor. It also got a special recognition for excellence in filmmaking from the National Board of Review of Motion Pictures. It has a 87% critic score on Rotten Tomatoes and an 83% audience score and a 3.3 on Letterboxd. Despite the perception of the film, it is generally considered in a favourable light, so much so that it has been given a Criterion release. But that doesn't mean that there aren't people who really hate it. So now I'm going to read the most popular reviews that are currently on Letterboxd. This first one is by Zara and they say, keep Kevin Smith the fuck away from anything to do with LGBT culture and especially lesbians. So I think it's, it's really interesting that many people go into this film thinking it's about lesbians or about queer people. And I think when you when you watch it in that state of mind, you are probably going to come out of it quite pissed off. But I would argue that this film is not about queerness, it's wholly about straight masculinity. And I would argue that it's a massive indictment of it. I mean, I'm someone who really likes the film and I'm not gonna be like, you have to like it, even if it made you uncomfortable in its representation of lesbians. Controversial. Messy, messy, messy. This next review is by Brian Becker and they say, half of this movie's problems will be solved by the word bisexual. <laughs> And that's so true. You know, I've read a lot of criticism around the film. It wasn't something I noticed until I read the criticism, but Alyssa doesn't really ever refer to herself as a lesbian. She, she says that she's gay and she does say that she's never really been attracted to men and she maintains a like fluidity and openness around sex. But I think it is really interesting just what was available to people in terms of language in the 90s because everyone around Alyssa has something to say about her sexuality and I think a lot of that is kind of the point. A lot of the characters and you know from the reviews a lot of the audience don't seem to want to listen to what she is saying about herself. Which is quite annoying you know as someone who's a fan and a defender of the film <laughs> but you know a lot of that is probably down to the fact that it is deliberately written from a specific point of view and that point of view is a straight man who is convinced that he's a good guy even when he's being shitty and homophobic. Circling back to this review, yeah just say the word bisexual, it would have made people a lot less angry I think. This last review is by Ellie who <laughs> 
did not like the film and said the only funny thing about this movie is the idea that someone would give up sleeping with women to date the goateed crybaby which is Ben Affleck and yeah I think <laughs> okay you you have me there you know what is it about Holden that's just so so charming I I struggle to work it out but then again I <laughs> I know plenty of women who have dated the worst men so it's not like it's not realistic <laughs> i do think it's going to be interesting you know when, once i get into the spoiler section to just talk about the subjective voice of this film because i think that's what a lot of people are hung up on they went into this film expecting it to be an exploration of lesbian identity which is weird because it's a kevin smith film so he's never going to do that it is very specifically from a point of view character which he understands which is a straight man a gen xer who is sardonic and charming in a, a very ironic kind of way and kind of nerdy and views himself as like a good person in comparison to the men around him. And because he views himself this way, he doesn't feel like there's anything wrong with his perspective on the world, which is a problem when he interacts with marginalized people. I don't know if you can tell, but I, like this film and part of the reason why i like it is because it's very messy it's strangely candid for kevin smith and its representation of queerness is interesting because it's kind of abrasive and itchy to think about if that makes sense it's more interesting to me than like a lot of quote-unquote good representation i think more and more I'm becoming less interested in good representation and more interested in just people <laughs> just people I think I don't really want like boxes ticking so that movie producers can be like this will bring in a certain demographic I want stuff that's like thought provoking and this film really was for me and I think I watched it at a time where I didn't really know where I stood with myself. And there is a particular monologue, which I think I'm gonna put a clip in later on in the podcast, where Alyssa just discusses her sexuality in such an interesting way. Alyssa has a few monologues in this film, but it's the one that hit me the hardest. And I think that's why this film has stuck with me because within the shitty subjective point of view that we are, made to view Alyssa through. There are glimpses of a real human person who is existing outside of this man. I'm gonna give a spoiler warning now. If you haven't seen the film and it's something that you wanted to watch, this next section will spoil it for you. So I'm gonna give a warning here to go and watch the film and then come back and listen to the podcast if you don't want it spoiled for you. I have to sit here and work up the desire to fuck you later. Please. <laughs> you said fuck. She said fuck. You said fuck to that girl. You said that you'd fuck her. And? Well, how can a girl fuck another girl? Were you talking about strap-ons or something? Oh, Jesus, would you shut up? What? It's okay. Uh, I just, I don't know how many times I can apologize for him. No, Binky, I've never used a strap-on. Well, then what's with saying fuck? Shouldn't you say eat her out or at least modify the term fuck with something like fist? Let me ask you a question. Can men fuck each other? What are you asking for my permission? In your estimation. Sure. So for you to fuck is to penetrate. You're used to the more traditional definition. You inside some girl you do jackhammer in a way, not noticing that bored look in her eyes. Hey, I always notice that bored look in her eyes, all right? <laughs> Fucking is not limited to penetration, Banky. For me, it describes any sex when it's not totally about love. Let's set the scene. We are in the late 90s and we are post-feminism and we are trying to discuss sexuality in a nuanced way. How is that going to look? Not great. <laughs> this film has a very specific view that we are kind of forced to tread over so as these characters like shout <laughs> like shitty opinions we are 
made to somewhat identify but mostly break down what it is that is causing them to to act in these ways so let's start with banky because he's a he's a fucking mess his character acts as like holden's quote-unquote voice of reason so he is like the guiding force of heterosexuality he's constantly like knocking down queerness and reasserting what is meant to be natural one of the strangest things that he says and is not it's not challenged, really. It's also not expanded upon. He he asserts that everyone needs dick. And this is specifically when referring to lesbians, right? He doesn't he doesn't understand lesbian sex, which, you know, is not surprising. And he asserts that everyone needs dick. And he doesn't clarify do straight men need dick. Like what was what what was meant to be <laughs> what was meant to be conveyed with this i mean on the surface it's just the assertion of heterosexuality and male dominance right there are certain things that are naturalized and that any kind of challenges to this to the average person are seen as like baffling so it's not just banky that views gay sex as unnatural or just like strange. Holden also has these has this point of view. He states that how can a tongue be enough, you know? And all of this really, it all spans from a, a place of insecurity that straight men base their sexuality around if they can successfully attract and then sleep with straight women or you know in the the fantasy world of the film if they can convert lesbians with their magical penis into nice good straight women who want nice heterosexual monogamy it's a reassertion of heterosexuality it's a frail kind of masculinity where heterosexuality is essential to the self-esteem of men because if they're not constantly proving to other men that they can attract women then they have failed alongside biphobia which is not a word that's said in the film because bisexuality does not exist in the film <laughs> i mean it does but it's never said you know obviously but we do get pretty much all of the fears all of the like stereotypes around why straight and gay people alike don't like bisexual people particularly bisexual women because they are seen as transgressors of the binary of monogamy they are promiscuous they will cheat on you they will look at other women and want to have sex with them and that is a threat to you because that's your job you're meant to do that but also they will look at other men and want to have sex with them too which is bad because you're the only one who's meant to be having sex with her so as a straight man you get angry and pissed off and you lash out and you say horrible things this manifests in the end with a proposed threesome the film like presents these men as like somewhat marginalized and i am going to explain so don't don't worry but we are introduced to them at comic-con which you know in the 90s being a nerd was like its own minority group not like now where you know superheroes comic book conventions are mainstream we are presented with these men who view themselves as outsiders but in terms of like actual marginalization they don't experience really anything so when they interact with marginalized groups it's very jarring for them they view any kind of transgressive behavior and i am talking like anything that is not basic banky calls holden conservative right even though holden has been the more progressive one of the two banky says that Holden is too conservative for Alyssa and that is the essence of the film where in terms of how you view yourself and how you actually are Holden is a basic 
little bitch. He wants heterosexual monogamy where he's a strong man who does strong man things and he wants a normal wife who will be a wife and do wife things and he tries to make them a normal couple. The fantasy of changing a lesbian with your dick ultimately ends with you are now the monogamous heterosexual partner of me. Yes, that's that's what was happening. But then Holden is confronted with the actual fact that Alyssa has had sex with men multiple times in her past and this then drives him insane despite the fact that heterosexuality was what he was looking for in this woman. I think it's really interesting that, okay, so we view the conflict towards the end where Holden finds out that Alyssa had a threesome when she was in high school with two men. We view this from his point of view. We are somewhat, I mean, I'm not, but the audience is expected to be on Holden's side because Alyssa didn't share this information with him. But, you know, I've watched this film multiple times. I identify more with Alyssa than Holden, let's be honest. And considering just how Holden is, <laughs> who he hangs around with. I think Alyssa made a pretty good judgment call, if we're being honest. It is hard to kind of pass whether Alyssa is ashamed of her past. I think because she found queerness so liberating that actually the parts of her past where she was conforming, where she was having relationships with men, does she view that as shameful? Where she views that as a time where she was trying very hard to be normal. It's kind of interesting to view the film as Alyssa trying to do that again, as like repeating that pattern of trying and failing to conform, not finding happiness there. Queerness was very liberating to her and she was very happy in it. You know, she talks so openly and so joyfully about gay sex, about like fisting and you know oral sex. There's that scene where Banky and Alyssa, they both discuss the various incidents they've received whilst performing oral sex on women. And that scene is so joyful. And it's not just because it's a Jaws reference, though I am always tickled to, to have a film reference Jaws. There is an inherent queerness to Conolingus because it's always been a kind of marginalized sex act, which is such a weird, such a weird thing to say. But there was a time where <laughs> going down on women was seen as gay. It's very funny, but very like sad as well, because I mean, this isn't the kind of thing that I thought I'd be discussing on this podcast, but a straight man going down on a woman is not a gay act but the fact that it is associated with queerness has kind of made it abject to straight men and I think Banky and Alyssa discussing it so openly it's just it's really it's interesting that with the right framing of this film you're watching a woman try for a second time to conform to heterosexuality and have it fully explode once again because she tried to be with men and she found that they were unpleasant they treated her poorly they weren't very good at sex so she explored her relationship with women and she found a lot of joy and friendship there and once again she she was dragged back back to heterosexual monogamy and it ended with holden proposing that they have a threesome with his best friend because he was insecure that she had had group sex before without him, with men. One of my favourite things about Alyssa is that she constantly stands up for herself, even though she shouldn't have to. At no point should she, had, should she have had to explain her decisions, but she constantly defends the position that sex is pleasurable and that she should be allowed to have it and that Holden's point of view is wrong that her sexuality does not belong to him and that he has no right to hold it over her or judge her for decisions that she made and that his grudge or his insecurities about 
how she used to spend her time are his problem. And I just, I love that the film reasserts that and that the film ends with Holden apologizing. There are many films that I've watched kind of similar to this. One that comes to mind is High Fidelity, which I hate. It's a film that I hate because it reminds me so much of this film, except without any of the catharsis. So High Fidelity is just a shitty nerd guy who views himself as a good person. And the film is somewhat aware that he's shitty, but he's never punished for these actions. He constantly is a terrible person and succeeds all the time. This is a spoiler, I'm sorry. The film does not end with him being set on fire or run over by a bus. No, he ends up fairly unscathed, a little too unscathed in my opinion. What I like about this film is that it holds itself up to scrutiny constantly. It's not, is asserting heterosexuality and then asking why that assertion is there. It is exploring queerness in a way that feels realistic to straight audiences, which is, I think most straight people, particularly straight men, encounter queerness through homophobia. And that's just the truth. The flurry of slurs that come out of Banky's mouth and the, just the general bigotry and how casual it is, is very realistic. There was nothing about this film where I was like, oh, well, that, that's a bit exaggerated. I don't think that would, that would happen. I think all of this would happen in real life. I think all of this has happened in real life, actually. There is a lot to interrogating the idea that women's sexuality is for men, it is about men all the time, even when they're not meant to be involved at all. I don't want to disregard people's perspective. I understand why people don't like this film. Okay, I'm not under an illusion. I get it. Telling a queer story from a straight point of view is always kind of iffy, but I think unlike a lot of the straight stories about queerness that I've seen, this one explores themes, which is nice, but particularly themes of what is normal, what is the standard, why is that the standard? and who is upholding it. Whereas I think most of the films about queerness being viewed by cis and hetero perspectives is that from what I've noticed, a lot of them are about straight people dealing with their queer partners, queer siblings, queer children, and it's about them coming to terms with it, right? This is not a film where Holden ever comes to terms with it. That's not what the film is about because Holden doesn't care to. His journey was to act selfishly and then continue to do that until he blew up his own relationship. He does not want to accept Alyssa's queerness. He is only interested in folding her into the standard of girlfriend that he wants. So I think it's really interesting that it kind of undermines every kind of story about straight people viewing queerness because it defies a happy ending and it defies a clean perspective that will leave you with a warm feeling inside. When I, when I finish this film, I am relieved that this relationship has ended and that's truly quite cathartic for me because I want the best for Alyssa. I want her sexuality to be respected and I want a better world where there is a grey area and that grey area is respected. I came to this on my own terms. You know, I didn't just heed what I was taught. Men and women should be together. It's the natural way. That kind of thing. I'm not with you because of what family, society, life tried to instill in me from day one. And to cut oneself off from finding that person, to immediately half your options by eliminating possibility of finding that one person within your own gender that just seems stupid to me so I didn't but then you came along you the one least likely I mean you were a guy and while I was falling for you I put a ceiling on that because you were a guy until I remembered why I opened the door to women in the first place not limit the likelihood of finding that one person and compliment me so completely. So I did talk about it in the last section 
but this film sets up a fairly clear dichotomy of queer women and the relationships that they have with straight men. Now this is tricky, right, because there is a particular very harmful trope of a lesbian who just needs to have sex with a man and then she'll stop being a lesbian, right? That is the main gripe that people have with this film. So I'm gonna read just various pieces of criticism kind of in a row just to illustrate my point. So Judith Keegan Gardner said of this film in her book Masculinity Studies and Feminist Theory that it was representative of a fairly repulsive genre of films that feature a heterosexual conversion narrative that is set in motion by the desire of a heterosexual person for a seemingly unattainable gay person. And this comes from a place of fetishization. John DiCecco, a psychology professor, said of straight men that they tend to not feel threatened by lesbians because they can't imagine women having sex without their aid. And even Guinevere Turner, who had a, a brief cameo in the film, said that lesbians were really not going to like it because it's about a lesbian who has been a lesbian her whole life and she stops being a lesbian to be with a man. But, you know, even she said that it's, it's more of an exploration of complicated, of, of a woman with a complicated sexuality, which, in my opinion, is far different from the stories that I have seen that they're referring to, because it is a genre of film. I'm not, I'm not discounting people's discomfort with that, but I do think it needs to be emphasized that this film is not about a successful conversion to heterosexuality. It's not a happy story where a lesbian is cured by dick, right? It's a queer woman who is trying desperately to please this man and he is picking holes in the relationship because he's so insecure about himself. That is, in my opinion, that's the story that's being told. And I think there are so few films that explore the dynamic of bisexual women and straight men and the harm that is caused within these relationships. It's very significant that Alyssa really only describes herself as gay and not, not a lesbian. She's very knowledgeable and she's very aware. She acts like someone who really does know her own sexuality and I think it's significant that the word bisexual is never said. Let's just all admit to ourselves, we don't really like bisexual people. So would it have helped if if she had called herself bisexual? Or would it have just stoked the flames on other reasons to not like this character, to not like this movie? There's a really interesting article in Collider, kind of defending this movie in, this, in a similar way that I am that kind of discusses the bisexuality in this film. This is what it says. Pretty much every member of the gay community experiences prejudice in different forms. For a lot of bi people, that prejudice is the rejection of both people on the gay side and the straight side of the spectrum. This causes a feeling of isolation, especially when a group of people are supposed to be in the same community as yourself qualify you as not being queer enough, as if there is a hierarchy of gayness. This ultimately leads to bisexual people and other people along the spectrum that don't fall directly in the binary of gay or straight to use gay as sort of a catch-all term. And I will say that from personal experience, just saying gay is easier. Saying gay or queer indicates to people not straight. Whilst bisexual is a wonderful term and I love it, it has a lot of connotations and I don't mind these connotations really, but I don't want to have to explain myself to people. And I don't, you know, I'm not sure that Kevin Smith intended to have all this nuance baked into his film, but I think bisexual women in particular just get a lot of scrutiny about their sexual history and their preferences that they don't want to have to explain. So just saying gay is fine because then they know that you are attracted to women and that you are more specifically not attracted to them. By them I do mean men. I think the relationship that bisexual women have with men is interesting, isn't it? Because it's not the same relationship that straight women have with men. The dynamic of bisexuality is, is like the incision point 
of where straightness and queerness interact and often where the most prejudice comes from. Nevertheless, Alyssa is a character that is constantly holding people up to the standards that they set. And she does this even if it means rejection. She is rejected by her lesbian friends for dating Holden. She is rejected by Holden for having sex with men. I wish that she didn't ever apologise for her decisions, but, you know, towards the end, she does end up saying I'm sorry quite a few times. I'm always like really sad and kind of angry that she's had to do that, that she's had to explain herself. It's not an alien experience, is it? I think a lot of women have to concede to the standards of their boyfriends. I think a lot of women do that because it's what's taught and it's what's expected. It's kind of a grin and bear it kind of situation where love even if it's awful and is actively hurting you is the end goal and what will bring you the most satisfaction even if it's not evidence-based i'm gonna read a quote from mary sue about this film there are men who view bisexual women as attainable lesbians slightly kinky open to threesomes with two women and someone they can lust after women with but ignore the side of them that is attracted to men the type of guys who don't consider it cheating when their girlfriend sleeps with another girl but it is cheating with another guy they may see themselves as open-minded but all it proves is that like holden they have a naive and infantile view of female sexuality that really is like the kicker is that we don't get to see the version of the film where Alyssa is happy and enjoying herself because this film despite being under the romance category is not a love story but rather a failed attempt at conformity and a mistake that I think many queer women make trying to appease or appeal to straight men will bring you like a kind of safety i do want to emphasize i'm not like blaming Alyssa for her choices in this film because i understand them and i empathize with her and i am glad that the film ends with her just writing a little comic book and hopefully healing learning and not repeating this experience what i liked the most about this film is that it's so honest and for once it's not stroking the ego of its intended audience which i think is also straight men who like kevin smith films who view themselves as more progressive than people who like action movies who whoever is the most traditionally masculine man they view themselves as more progressive than those people the film sits you down and is like are you or do you just view queer women as like a fun little adventure that you'll go on and then, you know, abandon because you're selfish and insecure? I think that's really interesting. I can't really think of another film that's done it that well. I think Scott Pilgrim was kind of a failure in terms of how it broke down this kind of masculinity. Chasing Amy, I have not seen a film like it. Does it look like a badger? I'm going to say no. I know a lot of people will disagree with me, but I think this is a very candid film that is treating its audience with respect, if not in like a an abrasive kind of way. If I were to remake it, I'd just be like, maybe just say the word bisexual so people will stop being so annoying about the <laughs> about the film. I would have liked to know more about Alyssa. Stuff like outside of her sexuality. That really is like the limit of a subjective voice. We only know Holden and Holden only knows Alyssa as a fetish object. So we don't get to know about her cool comic book or her hobbies or her band that she used to be in or how she feels about her own queerness. You know, we get the odd sprinkling of it. She's someone that I just like to talk to. I think she sounds interesting and I would have liked to see more of her. <laughs> You might have come to this episode because you hated Chasing Amy and you wanted me to like tear it down and you've sat, <laughs> you've listened up to this point and you're like, well, she likes the film. So this was a terrible time for me. Fear not. I have some recommendations of films that you probably will like. The first film is Appropriate Behaviour, which is a film that follows a bisexual woman. She is the subjective 
character. We follow her story as she handles her breakup, trying to heal her heart by revisiting moments in her old relationship and trying to explore her sexuality a bit more. My second recommendation is Princess Sid, which follows a teenage girl who stays with her aunt for the summer and begins a relationship with a barista whilst trying to process a traumatic event that happened in her past. I like both of these films. I think they have interesting explorations of female sexuality from the point of view of queer women. I wanted to thank you very much for listening. I will be back in March where I am very specifically going to focus on queer women. If you'd like to stay updated, please make sure to follow me on Twitter at like a badger pod. Follow me on Spotify, YouTube and TikTok for full episodes and teasers. If you'd like to read more of my work, you can find my writing at ambercomwalk.com. And if you'd like to tip me for the work that I've done here, you can donate to my coffee, which I'll put in the show notes. All of my sources are also in the show notes. Thank you again for listening and I hope to see you in March. Bye!